Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the 2022 MGFA National Patient Conference. Thank you for joining us and for supporting this important program. My name is Brian Gladden, and I'm the chair of the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America Board of Directors. I've been on the board of MGFA for three years and have personally benefited from the great work of this organization since I was diagnosed with MG a little more than six years ago. Like many of you, MGFA has had a big impact on my life, and I'm honored to be able to give back and be part of this amazing organization. Despite the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, MGFA had a terrific 2021, and we hope that our new programs and offerings are helping you, our patients. We also funded more research into the causes and treatment of MG than ever before. I couldn't be more proud of our dedicated staff, our volunteers, and our whole MG community. On behalf of the MGFA Board of Directors, we hope that you enjoyed the first day of our annual patient conference and that you're finding it educational and informative. Today, we have a full agenda and lots of great topics. We'll learn from experts on topics such as new treatments in MG, ocular MG, and the standards for IVIG care. We'll get a preview of our international conference, which will take place in May. We'll learn about becoming a patient advocate and how to apply for clinical trials. And finally, we're also going to give you a sneak, sneak preview of the MGFA online community, which we're very excited about. Before we go into these exciting sessions, I'd like to introduce Samantha Masterson, MGFA's president and CEO. Sam will announce this year's MGFA award winners. Sam? Thank you, Brian. I always feel so lucky because I get the distinct honor of being able to announce the recipients of the MGFA National Volunteer Awards. It's a very special part of our program. I know that the team and myself always look forward to it. It's a special time to recognize those individuals and partners who have really gone above and beyond and stand out. Um, the, the award recipients are selected by the staff who work very closely on the front lines with these awardees. Um, and we're just so proud to give these awards for these exceptional individuals and partners who have really gone above and beyond um, with their level of volunteerism and support. So just so you know what to expect, we will be giving 10 awards and I will speak a little bit to what the award is and then I will share a bit about each award recipient and then I will invite each recipient to say a few words. So our first award is the Ellsworth Award. This award is named for the founders of the MGFA. It recognizes an individual who has rendered distinguished service to the MGFA over many years, no less than 10 years. The recipient of this award has demonstrated long time commitment, stellar leadership, and passionate dedication to the MGFA and the MG community. This first award that we will be recognizing is bittersweet for all of us. This award is being given to Nancy Law posthumously and Nancy's family will be accepting the award in her memory. When we consider distinguished service over many years, long time commitment, leadership, and a legacy that demonstrates impact and positive influence for those who live with MG, Nancy Law is a very obvious choice. She was quite literally the gold standard for volunteerism and served as a model for others. I had the great pleasure of knowing and working with Nancy for a year and a half. And I know that so many of you knew her for much longer. And some of you were friends with Nancy for decades. To meet her was to know her. She was so kind and passionate, so sharp and well-informed and so impassioned, loyal and dedicated to the MG community. Nancy was a patient herself serving as a longtime volunteer for the MGFA, which then led to board service, which then led to her serving as the CEO for the organization. And most recently, Nancy served as the chair for the MGFA board of directors. She served as a patient advocate, a strategic partner, a thought leader, a volunteer, and a donor, and a friend for so many, many years. It is with the deepest gratitude and love 
that we honor Nancy's memory and her legacy with the Ellsworth Award. I now would like to invite Nancy's family to say a few words. Thank you, Sam, and to everyone at MGFA for recognizing my mom's contribution to your organization and to the community. She was a true MG warrior, and I'm grateful for everything that you've done to celebrate her legacy and recognize her life's work. She would have been truly honored and probably a little embarrassed to receive this award. I can picture her now, and I can almost hear her voice as she would have expressed complete pride in the entire MG community and highlighted how you were all committed to a world without Myasenia Gravis. She would definitely have recognized that she was not the only one, but one of many people who have driven MGFA forward and that the organization's success belongs to the entire MG tribe. Thank you again for honoring her with this prestigious award. I would like to thank Nancy's family for um, being here with us today and for saying a few words and for certainly accepting the Ellsworth Award. Um, I know how much that means to her family and it certainly means a lot to us that they could be a part of this program. Our next award is the Impact Award. The Impact Award recognizes a volunteer that has changed the trajectory of the MGFA. This recipient has made an extraordinary impact on the organization through exceptional leadership, collaboration, innovation, and dedication to the MGFA. The recipient of the Impact Award is Paul Strumpf. Paul serves as an MGFA board member. He's also um, serves on our Medical Advisory Council, and he serves as the chair of our governance and nominating committee, as well as the chair uh, for the MGFA Industry Relations Workgroup. He works with the team closely on some of the organization's biggest initiatives, such as the MG Patient Registry, Board Development and Governance, and Strategic Partnerships. And all of these initiatives have outcomes with significant impact that can quite literally change the trajectory of the organization in our future. He is a volunteer leader who often feels like an extension of our team through all of the support, collaboration, and certainly how he enables us to continuously lean into his vast experience and expertise. We could not be more appreciative of his time, his dedication, and his partnership. We are proud to give this impact award to Paul Strump. I'd like to invite Paul to say a few words now. Thank you, Sam. I'm honored to receive this award. When I graduated from medical school, I thought I knew it all. What a mistake. Over the years, I've learned that to serve and make a positive difference by my actions, I must see the world from other perspectives. When I was diagnosed with MG in 2019, Suddenly, the MG world was also my world. My volunteer path became clear, and I am thankful for this opportunity. The contributions I have made were achieved on the shoulders of others with the support and facilitation of a world-class staff, which Sam Masterson has assembled at MGFA to create connections, enhance lives, improve care, and cure MG. Thank you for this opportunity. I now hand the program back to Sam. Our next award is the Medical Professional of the Year Award. The Medical Professional of the Year Award is given to a medical professional who consistently achieves high standards in the practice of MG medicine and who is a leader and role model by their peers. The recipient of this award exemplifies excellence and dedication towards advancing the field while sharing expertise to educate the medical and patient communities alike. The recipient of this award is Dr. Jeffrey Guptel. Dr. Jeffrey Guptel, known as Jeff to us and to many, is one of the very best medical partners that I have ever personally worked with. Most recently, Jeff served on the MGFA Medical Advisory Council, which we call our MAC, as well as served as the chair of the MGFA Medical and Scientific Advisory Board, which we call our MSAP. In these roles, Jeff's leadership was just, it was so instrumental and so critical, particularly in the last few years. We not only were navigating the COVID pandemic, but MGFA was also experiencing tremendous growth and change as an organization. Jeff's expertise and leadership helped us to navigate the most challenging times and yet some of the most exciting times. 
He offered his guidance and medical expertise in MG during a number of educational webinars and presentations, and even our new town hall meetings. Jeff has always been available and extremely generous with his time in order to help and inform the MG community. In fact, we often say, we just don't know how he finds all this time. He's been so accessible to us. His consistent support and thoughtful approach coupled with his calm demeanor, which we really appreciate, was exactly what was needed. And for this, we will forever be grateful to Jeff. On behalf of our team, we want to thank Jeff for sharing his expertise and leadership over the last few years for being so generous with his time and for his partnership. We are proud to give Dr. Jeff Guptal the Medical Professional of the Year Award. Jeff. Thank you, Sam. I am very honored to receive the Medical Professional Award from the MGFA. The past year has been a time of tremendous change as the, MD, as the MGFA has changed its organizational structure and is working on an ambitious strategic plan. It has truly been a pleasure to work with the MGFA team. I have also been fortunate to work with many colleagues, talented clinicians and researchers on projects, educational programs, and research that impacts patients with MG. I'm always impressed by the dedication of the patients, their caregivers, clinicians from many disciplines and research professionals who are working to make the lives of patients better and overcome the challenges that we face. These individuals have also given a lot to advance the cause and should be recognized. There are several important advances for patients uh, that have occurred in the past year, and I'm absolutely certain that there are even greater advances coming in the very near future. I look forward to seeing how future recipients of this award will have improved the lives of patients with MG. Thank you. Our next award is the Volunteer of the Year Award. This award recognizes an outstanding volunteer for dedicated service and significant contributions to the MG community by serving in multiple capacities. The recipient of this award is a leader among the volunteer community and has upheld the MGFA's mission and values while representing high standards and collaboration. This year's award recipient is Tom Larson. And I just cannot wait to share a little bit about Tom with all of you. Tom Larson, also known as Rocket Man, is a quintessential volunteer, determined and mission focused, creative, and a strong advocate and ambassador for the organization. Tom was diagnosed with MG in 2008 and he and his wife, Frances, found MGFA by 2009. Together, they have attended 10 MGFA national conferences up until the pandemic. And in 2013, they formed an MG walk team. Tom, being a rocket scientist, named the team Tom's Rockets, blast off for the cure. To date, Tom's Rockets have raised over $110,000 for research. And walk participants across the country recognize Tom's team because of his 46 inch high model rocket. And as I said, they call him Rocket Man. In the past, he's received awards such as Most Valuable Fundraiser, the MVF Award, and the Reach for the Stars Award. So he has a history of breaking records at MGFA. But Tom doesn't just attend MGFA programs and lead a fundraising team. He also serves as an assistant support group leader in Virginia and hosts their monthly meetings. And finally, Tom also serves as an MG friend and offers emotional support and helps to identify resources for newly diagnosed patients. It's fair to say that Tom is selfless, compassionate, so generous of his time and talent, and we are so grateful that he is an MGFA volunteer. I cannot think of anyone that deserves this award more than Tom Larson. We are so proud to give the Volunteer of the Year Award to Tom. Thank you very much, Sam. I'm tremendously thrilled and deeply humbled to accept this award. I know so many MGFA volunteers who work tirelessly to help so many other people. I was diagnosed in 2008, had a major crisis in 2011, and formed our walk team, Tom's Rockets Blast Off for the Cure in 2013. So far we've raised over $110,000 for research to find better treatments and a cure. Francis and I have attended 10 
national conferences prior to the pandemic. I'm honored to serve as assistant support group leader of our Manassas, Virginia support group and to be uh, and to serve as an MG friend. Once this pandemic is over, we hope to gather again at national conferences where we've met such wonderful people. Until then, Godspeed and God bless every one of you. Our next award is Ambassador of the Year. This award is given to a volunteer who provides her talents, energy, and dedicated service towards high impact engagement to promote MG awareness. The recipient of this award has demonstrated active leadership to effect positive change and has gone above and beyond the call of duty to address challenges and to find solutions for patients in the MG community. I am so proud to share with you all that the recipient of the Ambassador of the Year Award is Adreja Swafford. Adreja became involved with MGFA in recent years, and she truly has become an MG ambassador in the most powerful ways. This past year, Adreja represented the MGFA and the MG community as a key stakeholder in a first-time drug assessment review in MG. This was led by the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, also known as ICER. ICER developed a value assessment for drug pricing on new MG treatments. Adreja was selected by ICER to participate as a leader to shape policy and to advocate on behalf of MG patients for affordable drugs and access to treatments. This support allowed MGFA to amplify the patient voice and to present compelling information regarding equity and access and pricing of new targeted treatments, as well as representing and sharing the patient experience, which is so important. Adreja's insights and overall representation of the MG community was critical in raising awareness and effecting positive change. Adreja will continue to work with our team on strategic priorities and focus areas such as healthcare disparities in underserved communities. For this reason, we are so pleased to recognize Adreja as the ambassador of the year. Adreja. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everyone. Um, saying hi and thank you so much for this honor from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My, um, it was a surprise to uh, be honored with this award and I'm so very appreciative and uh, really am thankful to the nominating committee and all who had a, a played a role in, in my um, being granted this award. I have been involved with uh, MGFA for a little bit, a couple of years. Well, several years, I guess I should say, and I've enjoyed my time with the organization more recently and I guess in the past year, I've, um, some of the things that I've been involved with have been um, really interesting and um, kind of on the forefront in terms of um, incorporating patient experiences with um, how decisions are made regarding the pricings of drugs and all the things that, are, that impact our daily lives as MGers and, and that impact our ability to live our lives to the fullest. So MGFA is doing some things and has been doing some things that I think have been uh, well received and well um, highly valued uh, for for people like me and, and, and other people who are just maybe just getting diagnosed. And so to be honored, um, with this award is, uh, it's, it's amazing for me. And, um, I, I'm definitely appreciative and, uh, and I think that, um, I look forward to being, um, more involved with MGFA and, uh, not because of the award, of course, but in general, uh, just because of the objectives that the organization has, has been developing and I, and I, I see the growth and I'm excited about it and, uh, to just be a part of, um, the, the movement that the association is making, um, now and, and kind of the strides we're taking into the future, uh, to be a part of it in this way is, is pretty cool. So thank you all. Um, I hope everyone's doing well and, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Our next award is the Emerging Leader Award. The Emerging Leader Award is given to a rising volunteer leader who inspires, energizes, and extends a strong commitment to support MG patients. 
The recipient of this award has demonstrated outstanding leadership and significant contributions to the MG community. I am so happy to share with you that the recipient of the Emerging Leader Award this year is Tony Gittles. It's always exciting to recognize a new volunteer, someone who really has um, stood out and who partners with both the MG FA team, staff team, and the greater community to inspire others through an exemplary commitment to our mission. Tony Gittles, an MG patient herself, has an extensive background in caregiving, caring for her own mother for years. She has traveled the world facilitating trainings as a certified caregiving consultant and sharing her expertise on this very important part of the human experience. She has brought this depth of knowledge and experience to MGFA. In this past year, she worked with the team to start the first MGFA caregivers support group. The importance of this particular support group cannot be understated. Its value is critical for those who give so much so tireless, tirelessly. And if you've had the pleasure of spending any amount of time with Tony, you would know how very special she is and why she is the perfect volunteer to lead this new support group. The team is so honored to recognize Tony Gittles with the Emerging Leader Award. Tony. Thank you, Sam. I am from the bottom of my heart, uh, appreciated and grateful to receive the Emerging Leadership Award from MGFA. Um, my Sini Gravis Foundation of America is such an essential organization for both those people caring for a loved one with myasthenia gravis and also those of us who are experiencing this disease. Um, I was absolutely tickled when Dova invited me to lead the first MG caregiver support group and I look forward to this every month. It is a form of self-care and support. Uh, for caregivers. Thank you again for this award. Our next award is the Outstanding Service Award. The Outstanding Service Award is given to committed board members whose service and contributions have been integral to the organization's growth and achievements. Recipients of this award have completed longstanding service on the MGFA Board of Directors and are recognized in their final year of service. We actually have three board members that we are going to recognize with the Outstanding Service Award. The first board member that I'm going to tell you about is Michael Lifshitz. Uh, Michael is currently serving his ninth and final year of service, serving three consecutive terms after joining the board in 2013. His connection to the mission began with having multiple family members living with MG, but his connection to the mission grew stronger through the many roles that he has served over the years. Specifically, Michael has served as a development lead for MGFA with a focus on fundraising through the MG Walk and community events. Michael has been an amazing ambassador for MGFA, often attending these events. You can find him at golf tournaments ranging from Florida to New Jersey. And he's connecting with and thanking our volunteers and we've received so much positive feedback around this connection that he's made over the years. And personally, it's been, been nothing short of a pleasure getting to know Michael. He is just a kind human being. He's compassionate and he's just so supportive. Um, he even started Friday check-ins with me, check-in calls. And I always enjoy our conversations because they're filled with thoughtful consideration about whatever we're talking about and lots of humor, which I really like about Michael. I know that I speak on behalf of the entire MGFA board and staff team when I say thank you to Michael for his longstanding service, for his contributions in so many areas, and for his partnership and dedication over the years. I would like to invite Michael to say a few words now. Thank you, Sam. I'm extremely honored to receive this award. To be involved with an organization that provides so much to its constituency has been a highlight of the last nine years of my life. This organization has grown in such positive ways while still maintaining its focus on the needs of those who live with MG every single day and those who support them. And to have been a part of that growth and mission is beyond gratifying. I'd like to thank all of my fellow board members, past and present, our professionals, but most importantly, every single person I have had the pleasure and honor of meeting these past nine years. Your courage humbles me, and I look forward to the time where I can hug each of you again. So let's keep fighting the good fight.
Our next Outstanding Service Award recipient is Dr. Jeffrey Guptal. Dr. Guptal recently fulfilled a term on the MGFA Board of Directors as chair of the MGFA Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. During this time as a board member, Jeff served as a leading clinical voice for MGFA and helped us to navigate the challenges of the global pandemic these past few years serving as a member of our Medical Advisory Council. His guidance and expertise helped us as an organization to provide timely and much needed information to the MG community as a trusted resource. In addition to serving as a leading clinical voice, Jeff has very much been an active participant in all MGFA programming across education, advocacy, and research. And most recently, Jeff served as co-chair for the MGFA International Conference, which will be held in May. Jeff's contributions have been significant, and we sure are grateful for his commitment as a volunteer leader on the MGFA board. Thank you, Jeff, for your service. Thank you, Sam. It has been a wonderful experience working with the MGFA board members. I've learned a lot by serving on, on the board. Learn from so many talented people with interesting backgrounds, experiences, and expertise. From a personal perspective, it has been very fulfilling to serve MGFA in this way. Thank you to you and your team of professionals for supporting me throughout my time on the board. And thanks to my fellow board members for all the guidance and insights that you have provided. The board has great leaders, and I look forward to hearing about the advances made possible by the drive and dedication of the MGFA board and the other members of this organization. Thank you. Our next and final Outstanding Service Award recipient is Annette Zimpelli. Annette recently fulfilled a term on the MGFA Board of Directors as chair of the MGFA Nurses Advisory Board. And during this time as a board member, Annette has served as a strong voice for patient advocacy and education, given her background as a family nurse practitioner. Annette has served as both an educator and a trainer, often speaking at MGFA conferences and participating in and supporting all MGFA programming. Annette has been very generous with her expertise and through her support, we have been able to enrich our programs and patient engagement. Thank you, Annette, for your time spent as an MGFA board member and for your contributions on behalf of the MG community. I really appreciate being recognized for my contributions to MGFA over the years. I have truly enjoyed being an active part of this organization, as well as being on the board of directors. It has been something very near and dear to my heart for the last several years. And it is quite bittersweet for me to step away right now. I know that MGFA is in such great hands as I step off. And I know that there are great things to see in the future with MGFA. And I will continue to watch from the periphery, even though I may not be able to actively participate. I wish all of you the best and know that I'm always with you in the heart and I'll, I'm, MGFA will forever be a part of me and I've enjoyed all of my time with all of you and making all of the friends friendship connections both personally and professionally and will treasure my time with you for the rest of my years so I wish you the best and have a great conference thank you Our final award today is the Strategic Partner Award. And I'm so happy that we're wrapping up with this award because it's such a big deal and it's such big news and we're so happy to be giving this award. The Strategic Partner of the Year Award is given to a partner that leverages its resources and expertise to accelerate positive impact and to improve the health and well-being of patients in the MG community. The recipient of this award has demonstrated strong collaboration and synergistic alignment to support MGFA strategic goals. We could not be more proud to share that the recipient of the Strategic Partner Award this year is Argenix. This award is particularly special given the timing of current events in the drug development space. In December, the FDA approved the Argenix developed treatment called Vivgart for generalized myasthenia gravis. This treatment has been a journey for Argenix as a global immunology company committed to improving the lives of people suffering from severe autoimmune diseases like myasthenia. It has also been a journey for the MG community, for MGFA as a patient advocacy organization that partners with Argenix, and for so many other key stakeholders. 
MGFA is honored to have been one of the first organizations to collaborate and to share MG information with our Gen X. When they first started their journey, Nancy Law and other members of the MGFA continually worked with our Gen X and provided MG expertise and knowledge to help the company connect with patients and community members and to design trials to ensure the success of the treatment. We congratulate our Gen X for this phenomenal achievement. And we thank you. We thank you for leveraging your resources and expertise to accelerate positive impact and to improve the health and well being of MG patients. We thank you for your very strong collaboration. And we thank you for your alignment. And we thank you for being such an amazing strategic partner to MGFA. On behalf of everyone at MGFA and the MG community, we are proud to recognize our Gen X with the Strategic Partner Award. Thank you, Sam. Our Gen X is proud and honored to be recognized as the Strategic Partner of the Year of the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America. Our collaborations have had a broad impact on the MG community, and they remind us that together we are better. We're proud and humbled to be part of the community and to have collaborated with the MGFA on important work, such as our design of our phase three ADAPT study for general myasthenia gravis patients, the design and enrollment efforts for a global real world evidence generation study for MG patients called My Real World MG, and uniting the MG community virtually during the pandemic with the premiere of A Mystery to Me, the first ever docu-series for general myasthenia gravis patients. We cherish the partnership with the wonderful staff and the board of the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, and we look forward to continuing this important work together. Dear Sam, dear staff, and dear board of the MGFA, our mission here at Argenix is innovation. Innovation starting from groundbreaking science and translating it into products which we hope can really transform the lives of patients living with severe underserved diseases like MG. And our innovation does not happen in a vacuum. We aim to collaborate with patients and their communities. We know we don't have all the answers and we make it a priority to listen to patients and their communities. Through our partnership, with the MGFA, we learn so much about the daily struggles and the aspirations of people living with MG. And we integrated these insights in everything we do, including how we design our clinical trials, how we conduct our clinical research, and how we bring innovation to patients. Back in 2017, when we met for the first time with Nancy Law and her friends and colleagues of the MGFA in New York City, we made a commitment. A commitment to bring an innovation to the market, which would be a precision therapy, hitting the underlying disease biology of MG in its heart without growth immunosuppression, without the roller coaster of having to balance symptom suppression with side effects of the medication so that patients being diagnosed with MG would no longer have to go through the same journey as Nancy did. And I am very proud of the fact we got FDA approval for Vivgard on December 17th and that we can look people like Nancy in the eye and say, we honored our commitment. I'm also extremely grateful for our long-standing partnership. Being named MGFA Strategic Partner of the Year means a lot to our Gen X. It is an honor and an inspiration to do even better every day for MG patients and their communities in the world. On behalf of the entire Argenix organization, I would like to thank you we are on this journey together, and this is just the beginning. We continue our work for all MG patients and look forward to a long-term strategic partnership.
Hi, I'm Caroline Gaylor, the Director of Development here at MGFA. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gil Wolf. Dr. Wolf is the Chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Buffalo School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, the State University of New York. His interests in neuromuscular medicine are wide, but have mainly focused on myasthenia gravis and other disorders of neuromuscular transmission, as well as peripheral neuropathies. Dr. Wolf will be speaking about new treatments for MG. Okay, so um, thanks so much to the MGFA for inviting me to speak. You guys have a great uh, group of speakers. I think Dr. Guptill is going to speak after me. Hopefully, he'll be able to get things a little bit back on on track time wise. I think we all went through a Groundhog Day moment there. I was trying to set up and I was going, didn't I hear this before? And in fact, I had. But anyway, so um, what I'm going to do is talk about agents that for the most part have only been used in the last four years or have not even been used yet conventionally. All right, so that's what we're going to do. And also try to place where these agents might be used in, you know, people. Uh, such as the audience that we have today. I don't think they apply to most of you, but they do apply to some, and we'll go through all that. Okay, and so the next slide, and these are just my disclosures. Um, do realize, now this is, uh, uh, I've modified this in slides since, but they make you send in your slides well in advance. Realize at the bottom there, all agents except for pyridostigmine, eculizumab, and now efgartigemide are either not approved or investigational for MG. So f as was just mentioned, is now approved as of two months ago. Here we go. To provide familiarity with the mechanisms of action, I'll try to explain them so, uh, so it'll be understandable. To be informed about new agents available and a few others that are in late stages of investigation, and to be aware of the recent update to the international consensus guidance on how we manage MG I co-chair that with Don Sanders. Pushpa Narayana Swami is our facilitator uh, uh, with that international effort. So as a clinical summary, I'm going to actually skip this because I imagine it was discussed already uh, in some of the other talks. So I'm just going to skip um, that slide. Go ahead to the next one on what myasthenia gravis looks like. But I do want to cover this. This just gives you an idea how we've improved MG treatment over the decades. This is uh, Dr. Grubbs. Uh, well-known paper that was published now um, over a decade ago. But we can see is over these different decades of time, the proportion of patients who've passed away very fortunately has gone down significantly. That's the dark black box. The proportion of patients, unfortunately, who go into remission hasn't really changed. That's the clear box. But the proportion of patients that we've had improvement in controlling their disease, that has gone up significantly over these decades as well. All right. So that's mostly very good news. Yeah, it'd be great if we see remission rates skyrocket, um, but that just really hasn't been the case so far. But we get a lot of patients into minimal manifestation status, uh, which is kind of the desired, at least getting to that stage of clinical improvement. Next slide, please. This is a more recent look from the Austrian group. And what I want you to see over here on the right is how all these different curves are uh, increasing over time, which means in this study that patients had minimal manifestation status of their disease, not just once in time, but at least a year, at least a full year in a row, they stayed in minimal manifestation status. That was a sustained improvement in their disease. And so who does the best? These are different subpopulations of MG. The people who do the best are actually the later onset receptor antibody positive patients, those who develop it after age 50. The Duke database has also showed that. So it goes a little contrary to a lot of disease states in humans, where the older you are, the worse you do. Here, actually, a later onset of disease actually predicts a somewhat better uh, 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 a chance of going into minimal manifestation status over time. But everybody does. All these different subgroups do. Even the seronegatives, which are in red. Look at the Musk patients. And I think I put that point here. The dark bold is my additions to their graph. That's from B-cell depletion therapies, rituximab. And I'm going to get to that on either the very next slide or the slide after, OK? But what you can see here is that minimal manifestation status or better for persisting for at least 12 months was seen in 2 thirds of patients, 63%. The median time to get there was about two and a half years. The death rates in this Austrian group of myasthenics was no higher than for the 
general population in Austria. That's good to see. Remember, I showed you that black box declining over time. Anyway, we do pretty well with this disease, really, but we can always improve, and that's where the new therapies come in. Next slide, please. Okay, where are the unmet needs of myasthenia gravis? And I'm sorry, I, I just got to turn my attention to something real quick. Um, so where are the unmet needs? This will account for maybe about a third of people overall, okay? But 10% of refractory patients, okay? The patients who just don't respond to conventional therapy, that's 10%. 20% of patients who are have their disease pretty well controlled as far as a strength standpoint, but they really are suffering from side effects. We see this commonly with corticosteroids. It can occur with some of the other agents as well. I'm not sure MuskMG is an unmet need anymore because B cell depletion has worked so well. There's still some patients who don't respond and will fall into refractory category there, but that has become less so, at least in my mind. MG during pregnancy, it would be nice to have other agents for pregnant women who have MG. We're fairly limited in what we can give them. MG crisis, how about something else besides just IVIG or plasma exchange? Plasma exchange is not even available in many centers in the United States. It'd be nice to have something else. Uh, to add to that, okay? And maybe something that has more persistence. Both IVIG and, and plasma exchange have relatively short uh, uh, durations of activity in MG. And so the hope is over time, this is direct language from the 2016 International Treatment Guideline that we'll have a lot of different agents we can plug into that sentence. The use of this agent as maintenance therapy should be considered for patients with refractory MG and those in whom immunosuppressive medications, you just don't want to use them because of some contraindication, okay? That will have quite a few agents that fit into that language and also language for other stages of treating MG, not just maintenance therapy, such as the crisis situation or women who are pregnant who have MG and so forth. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a slide I always kind of uh, previewed a little while ago. I just wanna go over this. This is a B cell depleting therapy, rituximab. It's not only used in musk MG, but this is kind of some of the strongest evidence of how well it works in musk MG. This was a multi-center blinded perspective review that Michael Hare did with colleagues. Dr. Silvestri in my department was one of the blinded evaluators of the patient's charts. They were de-identified. But what they basically looked at is patients with musk MG who either got rituximab over this 10 year period of time or did not get rituximab. Either they got it or they didn't get it and just looked at how they did. And a very novel outcome measure was used this combined um, the um, uh, uh, post-intervention status of a minimal manifestation status where, you know, you have minimal involvement of MG that really is not really interfering with the patient's activities or employment and so forth, combined with fairly low doses of medications. For instance, prednisone less than 20 a day, mycophenolate less than 2,000 a day, azathioprine less than 150 a day and so forth. It had to be combined. The patients weren't requiring very high doses of these agents in order to be in minimal manifestation status. That's called a level of two with this MG status and treatment intensity outcome. Next slide, please. So what I want to point to you here is everything on the green color, that sort of uh, light green color, and to the left is good. That's a good outcome. That's a two, one, or zero on that scale that Michael Hare uh, 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 um, generated uh, and came up with. So this is a baseline up here, these first two bars. And then down here at the final visit, the controls didn't get rituximab. The MUSP MG patients who did get rituximab are in that very bottom colored bar. Everything to the left of that green there is a good outcome. You could see it's a much higher proportion if they got rituximab. And some of the other data you can see here on the left, okay? So how much prednisone was needed if you were on rituximab? Only Less than a third of patients even needed prednisone and the mean dose was four and a half milligrams daily versus three quarters of patients who didn't get rituximab had to stay on prednisone at a higher dose as you can see here. There wasn't a lot of adverse uh, event data in this. There was one non-responder who had an uh, adverse event after initial dose uh, of rituximab. Another thing I'll point out, the number needed to treat was just two and a half. You only had to give rituximab to two and a half patients to get one of them to have this favorable outcome of that level two or less. 
Rituximab is not approved for myasthenia gravis. There was a study in receptor antibody positive disease that is now just getting published that was Neuronext, which failed to show that it, at least in acetylcholine receptor <coughs> antibody positive MG, that it acted as a steroid sparer. So it's not going to get improved MG, at least not anytime soon, may never. But there is data that really shows it works quite well in Musk, and I just wanted to show you that. All right, next slide, please. All right, so now let's move on to other therapies. We talked about rituximab that's depleting B cells here. What I want to move to now is several agents, one of which is approved, the eculizumab, also known as Soliris, that interferes with complement activation. And next slide, please. And so complement activation, if you can look at this figure and look at kind of this orangey thing on the left that has multiple components to it, that's the membrane attack complex. If you look, the antibodies are kind of in purple. They can activate this black structure right above them, which starts with C1Q and leads to a cascade of activation of complement proteins that end up making the MAC, which is C5B to C9, if you want to know specifically. But that MAC, what it will do is you see how there's some folds here in the membrane here at the bottom? It makes them all basically go away. It damages the muscle membrane, the postsynaptic membrane, the muscle membrane. So you cannot get good transmission of information, the chemical signal at the top here coming from the nerve of acetylcholine to the muscle down at the bottom. You cannot get good communication because the acetylcholine receptors are just simply not there in proper numbers. Next slide, please. So if we can block that complement activation, we could maybe make MG better. And that, was, uh, that is what was shown with eculizumab in the phase two study. And I'll just jump down here to the bottom. It did show on the MGADL score, which many of you have taken. It's an eight item scale that you can just fill out on your own, that there was better improvement, meaning a greater negative number on eculizumab versus placebo in period one of this crossover. Next slide. So the phase three study was done. This was the registration regain study. 26 weeks in duration. Patients either got eculizumab or not. The dosing was a little bit higher than that phase two study that I just showed you. And the bottom line here, I don't want to get in the weeds too much, but just about every single pre-specified outcome showed that eculizumab was better than the placebo in patients who were continuing their pre-existing therapy. These were in refractory patients, okay? Next slide, I wanna show you some more of the data. In the blue here are those patients who got eculizumab and the red is the placebo. And as you ascend here on these graphs going up, that's a better clinical improvement on either the MGADL or the quantitative MG score, okay? The QMG the doctors do, the MGADL the patient fills out, okay? As you get to greater levels of improvement, I think you can clearly see there that the bars are wider for the eculizumab, meaning that a higher proportion of patients met those improvement levels with eculizumab than they did with placebo. There's always a placebo response. Okay, next slide. And this is showing the initial parts of the study are all the way on the left, the red is placebo, the blue is eculizumab. You can see very quickly a drop, which is an improvement on a bunch of different scales. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there are four depicted here on eculizumab. And then patients were allowed who had been on placebo in the red here to cross over right around here. I know you can't see my arrows, but you see that red line dropping? That's when they got exposed to eculizumab from placebo. And again, you see a very quick improvement. On the right here, you can see the proportion of patients in the light blue who were the ones on eculizumab as far as exacerbations, rescue therapy, hospitalizations, the rates were much lower for these real life situations. Going to the hospital, needing rescue therapy such as plasma exchange or IVIG, that eculizumab reduced the rate of needing those real life interventions than what was seen with placebo in red or their baseline rates of these types of real life situations that occur when MG is not controlled. Next slide. This is just some side effects. It really has been pretty well tolerated. I do need to warn you, I think many of you know that this agent 
has a risk of meningococcal meningitis and some other infections, but meningococcal meningitis is the one we worry the most of. Even with vaccination, there was one case of meningitis after the data lock. It did resolve with antibiotics. Okay, it did resolve. Just so you know, this is with the eculizumab. Yeah, there can still be some myasthenia gravis exacerbations that occurred in about 20% of patients, but that was a much lower rate than what the rate had been without eculizumab before they were in the trial. Next slide. All right, ravulizumab. Maybe some of you were in this trial. This was approved in 2018 for a typical hemolytic uremic syndrome. That's what HUS stands for. The drug I just talked to you about, eculizumab, it requires initially every week infusions and then every two weeks. For as long as you need the therapy, as far as we know, every two weeks. That's a pretty big burden twice a month. This agent does the same thing, ravulizumab. It's actually uh, uh, being studied by the same company uh, uh, that uh, uh, markets eculizumab, but it only needs every eight-week administration. And I could tell you their, their study, the phase three study, <clears throat> did show positivity as far as effectiveness of this agent. For instance, at 26 weeks, a greater than five-point drop on the QMG was three times as more likely on the agent than it was on placebo. Okay, not every single one of the measures <clears throat> did show a statistically significant difference, but many of them did. There were two deaths in the ravulizumab group. One was from COVID-19, unfortunately. One was from a cerebral hemorrhage, a, a hemorrhage in the brain, not felt to be related to the agent itself. There were no meningococcal infections. By the way, headache rates were similar in the two groups. Just about every infused drug we give causes headaches. This has not been published in full. This was presented at the MGFA scientific session, the very last one that we had last year. Next slide. I want to tell you, so those drugs are intravenous. This is an agent that does, excuse me one second, that does the very same thing, blocking complement activation, but it's subcutaneously delivered. It is a daily agent. This was the phase two study and the phase three study data was just released and I'll get to that in a second. But I'm gonna show you the data from the phase two at this dose, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram subcutaneously. Next slide. These were also pretty tough patients like the patients in the complement studies that I already mentioned, okay? They had average QMG scores of 18 to 19. That's pretty high. This was for the different arms of the study. They had disease durations of almost a decade, eight years and still having active disease. Next slide. This is showing you the improvement on the QMG and the MGADL, the scales that I've talked about. Again, the lower your score, the better, showing statistically significant differences versus the placebo arm over periods of about three months. And again, you can see a pretty quick response, a pretty quick drop. Yeah, there's always a placebo drop, but the active agent showed a greater improvement. Next slide. This is showing you the proportion of patients who had an MGADL score that was perfect, meaning zero or one, zero or one out of this potentially 24 point score. Zero to one is doing really well. They call that minimal symptom expression or MSE for short, MSE for short. This is by week 12. You can see the proportion of patients getting either of the active doses was quite a bit higher than placebo. This dose in the red, the 0.3 milligram per kilogram daily subcutaneous, just a shot dose, is what was done in the phase three trial. Next slide. This is just showing, again, a crossover effect, like I showed you before with eculizumab, that crossover from placebo to the active drug, drug in the open label. Again, a quick drop showing improvement. Next slide. Quite well tolerated. In fact, at the highest dose, no patients needed any rescue therapy or plasma exchange versus about one in five of the patients on placebo. Headache, fairly low rates of headache with this agent. Again, next slide. Oh, so the phase three trial, that was on the prior slide, it's now complete. It's on some of my very recent slide decks, but this one is now several weeks old. Things are changing very fast. It did meet its primary and secondary outcome measures. Um, the phase three trial. So we will, I think, hear more about Zalucoplan, this daily sub-Q agent that likewise blocks complement activation, specifically by blocking a cleavage of C5. I don't want to get into too much details with that. 
This is just to remind you, if you're on any of these agents, you have to be vaccinated and stay up to date with vaccinations for meningococcus. The official name of that you can see here in white is Neisseria meningitides. We're all used to this by now. COVID, we needed a series except for the Johnson and, uh, and Johnson vaccine, which was one, but everything else needed some series and we all need boosters. You got to do the same kind of thing with both the ACWI, I call it, which is the conjugate or quadrivalent vaccine, and then men B. There's different strains, serogroups of meningitis, of meningococcal, uh, of the meningococcus, but they all need boosters. This is a schedule, and your doctor should be helping you stay on track on top of this if you're on these agents. And as long as you're on these agents, you need to continue to stay up to date on your vaccinations. Next slide. All right, so we talked about the complement issues. Now I want to talk about some very new news with Fgartigimod. Next slide, please. All right, so how does Fgartigimod and related molecules work? I think you guys know that IgG, that's sort of another name for antibodies. It's the immunoglobulin G type of antibody. It circulates in our blood up here at the top of this figure. IgG makes up all the antibodies that we pretty much know to date that cause myasthenia gravis. Whether you have receptor antibodies, whether you have musk antibodies, whether you have LRP4 antibodies, whether you have agrin antibodies, there are some IgG subtypes. IgGs last in our circulation longer than all the other forms of immunoglobulin. Why? Because of this. Because of this recycling network, which is mediated by the FCRN. What does that stand for? The neonatal FC receptor. It's shown in yellow and red in these circles. What it does is it takes in IgG, which are these sort of greenish Ys. That's what an antibody actually looks like under the microscope. They're kind of Y-shaped. Anyway, if these Ys bind to this red and yellow neonatal FC receptor, it gets recycled. These vesicles, which are called endosomes, end up releasing what they have bound to, those IgG molecules, into back into the circulation. That's why IgG persists in our system for weeks, whereas many of the other immunoglobulins only last a few days. But if we can block this binding to this neonatal FC receptor, guess what's going to happen to those Ys? They end up in the bottom left and get degraded in a lysosome. We have molecules that preferentially bind the neonatal FC receptor and prevent this IgG binding, thereby leading to destruction of IgG and reducing IgG uh, 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 levels in your bloodstream, including the acetylcholine receptor antibody, including the musk antibody. So it gets rid of IgG that's helping you fight infection, but it's also getting rid of disease causing IgG also, the IgGs that cause it, myasthenia gravis. So there's a potential risk of increased infections with these agents, and that was seen to some degree in the trials, but this is kind of akin to plasma exchange. Next slide. So anti-FCRN therapies are somewhat akin to plasma exchange. They lower all IgG subtypes by around 70% pretty quickly within a matter of a couple of weeks, okay? But these are intravenously or subcutaneously given agents. It's easier than plasma exchange, which requires large bore catheters, coming into a hospital, generally being plugged up to a machine that looks like a dialysis. It's a big deal. This is just infused or by injection medications. It could have efficacy across various MG antibody subpopulations, which the complement type agents don't because the only type of antibody we know of in MG that really activates complement are acetylcholine receptor antibodies. But this could be applicable, as I mentioned, across many types of subpopulations of MG. Next slide. So this is the phase two Fgartigimod trial and to not belabor things too much, in the light green here in the bottom of the, of the figure, you can see different levels of improvement with Fgartigimod in green versus the placebo in blue. This agent is given weekly, intravenously, 10 milligrams per kilogram. That's how it's labeled, okay? But you can see the Fgartigimod looking quite a bit better, like in other diagrams that I've showed you already, than the placebo. Let's go on to the next slide. 
This is the phase three ADAPT study. This is what the FDA looked at, namely this data, to approve the agent, as was mentioned before, right before the Christmas holiday. I think it was December 17th. I first heard about it over that weekend. December 17th, I think, was a Friday. Anyway, the proportion of patients getting 10 milligrams per kilogram IV every week for four weeks versus placebo, those who had at least a two-point drop in their receptor antibodies. Sorry, those who had at least a two-point or greater drop in the MGADL, those who had at least a three-point drop in the QMG, and this had to be sustained. It had to last at least four weeks in a row. Not everybody hit it, but about two-thirds of patients did with fgar and a much lower frequency on placebo. Again, there's always a placebo response. That was statistically significant. The proportion of patients who had a, a minimal symptom expression, that was also statistically significant, okay? All MG antibody subgroups showed some responsiveness to the agent. What was also nice to see is that there could be a durable response. So maybe these cycles of every weekly infusion for four weeks can be spaced out more than say every two months or even more than every three months. For instance, a third of patients had at least a 12 week durable response based on these types of outcome measures after a cycle that they could go quite a while before needing the next cycle. The actual mean time to need the next cycle was about seven weeks. Okay, just so you know, okay. It was pretty well tolerated. The headache rates were similar in both groups. There were actually fewer severe adverse events with the fgar than with placebo, 5% versus 8%. Next slide. Okay, and this is just showing you those kind of Christmas tree patterns. Again, as we go up here, those are even greater responsiveness levels, either the MGADL or the QMG. I think you can all appreciate the yellow bars are quite a bit wider, especially when you get to higher levels of response than placebo. You don't tend to see huge responses from placebo. You can see some milder, moderate responses. That's what you're seeing here with those gray lines really receding down as you get to better levels of clinical improvement on this responder analysis or what Dr. Howard likes to call Christmas tree plots, which I think is great. I love that term. Next slide. These are some of the adverse events. Just to realize, yes, there was somewhat higher rates of urinary tract infections, urinary, uh, uh, sorry, of urinary tract infections, upper respiratory infections than on placebo, but they weren't appreciably that much higher, 10% versus 4% or so. Anyway, there is, you know, we have to follow patients, but um, I don't think this is a major issue as far as infections. The infections were considered mild or moderate. I have this down here, no impact on serum albumin, just to point out that same pathway of recycling that I showed you, albumin uses it too. So there is a potential that some of these molecules, and we have actually seen that, can lower albumin levels. What that means significant uh, from a clinical standpoint, it's not major drops in albumin, but it's seen. It's something that we need to learn a little bit more about, but personally, I'm not terribly concerned about that. Next slide. All right, so this was approved, as I mentioned. It was actually on the December 17th. Monday was the 20th. It's approved in adult acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients. Why is it not approved in the other types of patients who were included in the trial? They were only included in small numbers, and the way the study was powered was specifically for the receptor antibody positive patients. That's the dosing, warnings, delay of active infections, and just realize, yes, some infections can be seen, and uh, more than 10% of patients can get a headache with it as well. Next slide. So we talked about these agents in red, but realize all the ones in black are other things that we're actively looking at in myasthenia gravis and in some other diseases that are neuromuscular related as well, like Guillain-Barre syndrome, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, those are two inflammatory muscle diseases. There is a lot of going on in neuromuscular disease, but MG is kind of the, what's the term I'm looking for? The vanguard, it is the vanguard. And what's amazing, fgar the first time this mechanism of action was ever approved for any human disease was myasthenia gravis. Really nice that myasthenia gravis is that vanguard disease. Next slide. All right, where would we use these older, these newer agents? Where? And this kind of gets to the title, when and should I? I think most of you don't need them, but some of you, they may play a role. Refractory patients. That's who was enrolled in the eculizumab trial. So, and maybe it's not just eculizumab used in refractory patients. Some of these other agents that I mentioned could be as well. But that would be a place to use these agents. 
How about an MG exacerbations or impending crisis or manifest crisis? Again, these agents have rapid onset within a few days, a, a week or so, which is what we need when we try to get people out of crisis. The one caveat with the complement inhibitors, you need that vaccination. And a lot of people have not been vaccinated in the past for meningococcus. So that is the one caveat. You could use potentially prophylactic antibiotics before the vaccines actually take effect. You want to be vaccinated at least two weeks before these agents are started in general. But if you're stuck, yeah, you could give prophylactic antibiotics. That would be penicillin or a third generation cephalosporin. Remember, ciprofloxacin can be used in that setting, but not in myasthenia gravis. There's a black box warning for fluoroquinolones, which is what Cipro is. You shouldn't use Cipro. You need to use something else. So that's that's why I have the avoid there in red. How about steroid sparing? These agents could help us reduce the need for steroids in MG patients, either as a bridge therapy, like IVIG is often used, before other things like the oral agents take impact, because it can take a long time for some of those oral agents to work, and even in longer term maintenance, potentially. So those are scenarios where these newer agents can come into play. Next slide. And now I'm going to finish with the last couple of slides. This is the list of international MG experts that Dr. Sanders and I assembled. And I just have in yellow Dr. Seya. He's my colleague down in Chile, who was added on. We didn't have a South American uh, expert in the first rendition of these, uh, of these consensus uh, uh, recommendations, but we do now. But we cover all the continents, basically. You can go through here. And uh, we do have an observer from the MGFA. And this was supported by the MGFA, this effort. Next slide. So the first things that we looked at in the 2016 uh, uh, um, statement, which is uh, which was published in Neurology, were these categories. I won't, you can read through them, but it included talk about myasthenia gravis, childhood MG, pregnancy, and so forth. Musk MG, next slide. This is, should be the last slide. The 2020 update is here. Um, we revised the thymectomy language because now we have the thymectomy trial data uh, from the New England Journal and the uh, Lancet Neurology Extension Study data. So we strengthened the language about uh, consideration of thymectomy and receptor antibody positive MG. We had comments about ocular MG, rituximab, methotrexate, eculizumab. All these, most of these are for newer things that we didn't have information on in 2016. And then also some cautions regarding immune checkpoint inhibitors. And that was published um, last year, uh, a little bit less than a year ago at this point. That's the end of my talk. Go to the next slide just to make sure. That's it. And so now I'll, I'll be happy to answer some questions. I know that was fairly rapid. I tried to move it on. I know we're behind schedule. But uh, I thank you for your attention. I hope it made sense. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. So because we are a little running a little late, I'm going to ask a few questions, just a couple, and then we'll try to get the answers to the rest of the questions and post them. So the first question is, what agents are available for seronegative patients? Well, everything for seronegative is off-label, except I guess acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. We have three agents, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, um, eculizumab or soliris, Fgartigimod or what's named Vivgard. But you can use agents off-label in the United States. So seronegative, pretty much everything I talked about, except the complement inhibiting agents, could be used in seronegatives. Realize there were some seronegative patients in the Fgartigimod trial. There were a handful or so. Actually, a little bit more than a handful. There were a handful of MUS patients and, you know, a couple of handfuls of seronegatives. Um, so they can be used in seronegatives, okay? The only thing that I would exclude would be the complement inhibitors. Those are really designed for acetylcholine receptor antibody positive disease. Now, I realize the other thing is a lot of seronegative patients may have acetylcholine receptor antibodies that we just don't pick up through the routine assays that are ordered. They have to be detected with cell-based assays, which are not yet commercial. Most of us in academic centers have ways to get those done if needed. The quick answer on the seronegatives, everything, but just exclude the C5 cleavage and other agents that may come into play that act that uh, interfere with complement activation. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, the next question is, what are your thoughts on stel stem, stel stem cell transplants? Well, 
for myasthenia gravis, there there has been some data, at, mostly out of, out of Canada. It is a very aggressive therapy. It has shown some promise in MS, mostly, because most of the studies have been done in MS, and somewhat in some refractory MG patients. There's very limited data. It is a very big deal to go through, okay, where you basically ablate somebody's entire immune system and then uh, try to replace it back. Um, I don't think it's ever going to be widely applied. I think there's so many other things that are coming down the pike in MG that don't have the risks, the graft versus host disease risk sometimes, the other risks that just are involved with ablating somebody's bone marrow, basically, which can lead to a lot of infection, opportunistic infection risk. But the group in Ottawa has studied this, um, but I don't think it's going to be widely used. Yeah. Okay, so we, we have pages and pages. I hope that wasn't a question about CAR T. CAR T is a whole different issue. Taking people's we have pages out. and pages of questions, which oh, we can't go, go, get go, go, to, go. but we will, we will get to all your questions. I know people are very excited about this talk. So the last question I'm going to ask you is, my wife had rituximab to treat LRP4MG three years ago. She had remarkable improvement from it and came off of all MG medications within a few oh. months. Are there studies to approve rituximab for LRP4MG patients? Are other studies being done for treatment of LRP4MG? So in Scandinavia, they're actually doing a trial with rituximab again. I think the rituximab story in the United States for now is dead, unfortunately. Um, that paper is going to come out in neurology very, very shortly that showed futility for rituximab to reduce steroid requirements in a year in acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients. Most patients were not included in that trial. I wish they had been, but they weren't. That was actually supported by our tax dollars. That was an NINDS supported study. But the Scandinavians are looking at it, but I think they're only looking at receptor and musk patients. They're not looking at LRP4. Realize LRP4 is extraordinarily rare. Trying to do a trial of LRP4 MG is gonna be extraordinarily difficult. Um, but I'm glad to hear, I've heard of other patients with LRP4 with responsiveness to rituximab. A lot of us think it works in receptor antibody positive MG, but we were not able to show it in the confines of that trial that I mentioned that's going to be published. That it's accepted now and should be in paper very shortly. <clears throat> but I don't expect an LRP4 rituximab study, and I don't expect it to be approved in the United States any time in the next few years, if not longer, unfortunately. Now, there are other B cell depleting therapies I didn't get into that are being looked at, anti CD19s, for instance. Maybe one of those will come. And they're very similar to CD20s, which is what rituximab is. Okay. All right, Dr. Wolf, thank you very much for your time. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for turning in these questions. And again, we'll get them answered and get them posted on our website. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. Enjoy, everybody. Take care now.